Welcome back to another episode of the Get Guys Podcast. Sean Allen here. We got uh, Ivo in the studio. We will turn on his genius neural mind here and let you guys get schooled by him in just a moment. This uh, podcast was recorded a while back. I've been slacking. We've got too many things going on, creating some new courses for our online CE program. You guys can go over there to uh, onlinece.com. Uh, Or you can go over to our website if you can't find the link, go to thegateguys.com, click on the Learn tab, go down to the uh, Online Education, and you'll be able to find the link over to onlinece.com. The latest one that we did was Biomechanics 202 on the foot and how it affects the body core, and it's kind of germane to what we talk about here. Even though this was recorded way back when, about a month ago, or a little bit more than that, uh, we were talking about the New York Times article where... uh, Usain Bolt was being digested biomechanically uh, from the experts, and we throw our two cents into the into the mix here. And uh, I think we bring up some good um, some some good cases on asymmetry and why it might matter. But it's a good debate, and uh, we uh, suggest that everybody keep their mind open on this debate because there's no way to prove it because we can't clone humans yet. But uh, anyways, we hope and we we hope that we offer you guys some alternative thoughts for some things that maybe open up your mind to a new way of thinking about things. And that is about it. We talk about some other things on the podcast that we find interesting. Ivo goes down a neuro hole there, um, which we all love, that rabbit hole that he goes down so well. So that is about it. We've got um, um, a couple other things. We talk about a plantar fascial uh, or a plantaris tears and a bunch of other things. But uh, as always, I like to go back and listen to these things after I edit them. And I learn from Ivo. I learn from our dialogue. And I learn from the uh, the, the broad... Uh, strokes that we paint and the detailed ones that we go through as well and uh, it's interesting that you can learn from the dialogues that you've had several months ago particularly when you've got a brilliant partner like I do so we hope you guys enjoy this show put on your ear cans we'll see you on the other side We're back again, podcast 128. I was on the line. We're just going to go right into this thing here. But uh, we put up some stuff on social media this week, and it is now the week of the 21st of July. Uh, so you guys will be getting this a week or two or three, a little later than normal. But um, you can find the studies all in the show notes. And uh, last podcast, we talked about the shoe cue, S-H-O-E-C-U-E. And that I had tried this thing out. It has the uh, the templated plastic on the heel to try and stimulate plantar receptors and change um, foot strike and maybe encourage a midfoot strike. And I will just put up a very interesting study on Facebook here today, and uh, hopefully that'll get translated over to our blog. But uh, as always, everything doesn't get translated over to the blog. So if you're not following us on social media, Twitter, Facebook. Uh, things like that, you're probably missing out on some stuff. So if you're a, a purist, you better just make sure you kind of uh, find another way to, maybe Twitter's the safer way instead of getting wrapped up in the Facebook uh, algorithm. But anyways, I will go ahead and talk about this superficial cutaneous sensory stuff, receptors in the feet and what they found because, you know, it kind of puts some, uh, a little lack of credence to the shoe cue, but I'm not saying that it does definitively because, you know, we really don't know everything right now. But in the research, what does this one talk about? Well, the study just came out, I believe it's in Gate Posture in April of 2017, and I actually found it in another journal. I was just perusing stuff, and um, it made me think of other things. But What they did is they took a sample of people. I believe it was 10. I do not have the abstract or the study up in front of me at the moment. Um, They took a sample of about 10 people, and they looked at their strike pattern, and they had them run um, in a minimalist-type footwear, I believe, or maybe perhaps it was barefoot. Anyway, it's it's a minimal-type footwear if any was present. And then what they did is they anesthetized the bottom of the foot uh, across the metatarsal heads, the arch, and the heel, <clears throat> and then looked at them again to see if their stride changed with the idea that th- there's been a substantial body of research showing that cutaneous receptors in the foot um, respond to and contribute to the mid to four foot strike that we see with barefoot and minimalist type shoes as opposed to heel striking in a normal shoe. So um, what they found is when they anesthetized the foot, there was no difference um, in the strike. In other words, strike pattern was the same. So they said, well, the cutaneous receptors aren't really contributing to this, which 
may or may not be true. The cutaneous receptors actually cause a lot of things. They respond to perturbations. They're going to respond to different postural cues, surface textures, um, and they're going to relay to the nervous system not only information about pressure um, and vibration, but um, also um, information which is going to help to coordinate things like arm swing and coordinated arm movement. Uh, cognition, it, it's pretty diverse if you start to delve into the literature and just do a PubMed search on something like cutaneous foot receptors um, and, you know, gait or whatever, and it'll bring up lots of stuff. I pulled up, I don't know, 20 papers or so just looking through stuff kind of quickly today. Um, what my take on it was, well, I didn't really think the forefoot strike pattern was resulting that much from the cutaneous receptors and the pressure receptors in the foot, but more so probably the mechanoreceptors in the muscles as well as the joints. We know the joints are blessed with four types of mechanoreceptors, you know, labeled one, two, three, four, with the type ones being kind of deep within the joint, type twos being on the periphery, threes being largely Golgi tendon organ-like, and type fours being nociceptors, um, as well as muscle mechanoreceptors, which of course consist of spindles, as well as Golgi tendon organs. And these are going to, uh, well, first of all, back up. There's very few studies looking at receptor densities and receptive field sizes um, in the foot. Um, there's a few. Um, there's one I just ran across that I'm trying to get the full text on to actually look at receptor densities. But my guess is, and I think it's a fairly accurate one based on sensory homunculi, is that we have a much larger population of muscle mechanoreceptors and possibly joint mechanoreceptors, although perhaps not, then we do pressure receptors on the bottom portion of the foot. And we remember that we don't only have pressure receptors, we have Merkel discs, um, we're going to have end bulbs of Krauss, we're going to have free nociceptive endings. So we have all of these other types of more peripheral, non-joint related fascial uh, mechanoreceptors that are going to occur in the foot rather than um, the classical we think of the type 1 through 4s. So they play a role more than likely, but they just may not play a role with regards to foot strike. Um, and that's really all the studies showed. It doesn't necessarily take away credence from um, that that's causing that. It shows you that when you anesthetize the feet, the foot strike pattern doesn't change. Um, that's what it shows you. So we're not enslaved specifically to just that specific brand or type of mechanoreceptor when we're looking at strike change patterns. Um, again, they all play a role. Mechanoreceptor information, we know, all travels up to the brain via either the spinal cerebellar pathways um, or the dorsal column pathways with a few other ancillary pathways throwing information in there as well. And that's all going to be coordinated not only at a cortical but also a subcortical and cerebellar level, which is going to create that thing that we call um, gait. So um, anesthetizing the receptors, you know, one, how much did they really get? Did they turn off nociceptors? Um, totally. You know, or with the particular... Um, anesthetic that they use, did that get the specific types of nociceptors or did it just dull the other receptors? And that's all food for thought. Um, but anyway, that was kind of the take on that. And that kind of bleeds back into um, Shad Foe's study that we looked at last podcast, looking at vibrations. The gal, if you remember, put um, tiny accelerometers in the shoe that measured um, how long you're speeding up or slowing down over time, and then talked about creation of shoes which actually attenuate or change this vibratory frequency um, of the shoe. But anyway, that was my take on mm -hmm. it. It doesn't necessarily take credence away from the shoe cue. It just means that it, you know it, it works. The shoe cue, you put it in, right? I could stick a rock under your heel or a sharp object or anything like that and make you run in your shoes and you're going to go to a forefoot or a midfoot strike because of the stimulus in the back. It just means the superficial cutaneous receptors or the ones within the fascia at that particular point are um, probably not involved as much as other factors. If you want a detail, you got it. So, um, you know, it's a, you know, it, it, it kind of goes back to all this barefoot stuff. Is barefoot better? And does barefoot running trigger a lot of the adaptations that uh, we need? You know, a lot of the studies have 
kind of been conflicting and, and uh, I still don't think that there's a definitive answer about heel strike or midfoot striking or minimalist running or barefoot running. Uh, it's one, I guess, what works for you, two, what doesn't cause pathology for you and lead to injury uh, and what is safe for you so you don't puncture the bottom of your foot. But, I mean, you got to do what works for you. But uh, extremism on these things, whether it's barefoot or, or minimalism or high heel ramp, delta ramp, uh, you know, cushioning or foam underneath the heel all those things seem to be a little bit extremist in thought and uh you know you and i always tend to tend towards heading in the middle of the group there and looking for things that make sense but aren't extreme and this one you know kind of you know supports that i, well, I will so. mention that the latest issue of lower extremity review which just came out in print the online is still the last issue has a large article i haven't read it yet it's just it's sitting on my uh <laughs> on my bathroom counter, actually. Um, but um, it has a large section on minimalist footwear and impacts in the latest in research. So I'm looking forward to reading that, and perhaps next pod we can kind of revisit some of the information um, in that particular issue. And again, folks, if you guys don't get Lower Extremity Review, you really should subscribe to it. It's free. They'll send you the print edition. The online edition is free as well. It's just about a, um, eh, two to four weeks behind um, the print edition, but it's just a plethora of great information. There's very little, um, you know, crappy advertising. The advertisements that are in there are usually for like AFO companies, people that do tech scan and different uh, force plate mapping technologies, um, and things like that. You know, you're not going to get stuff about deodorant mm-hmm. and, and things like that um, in there. It's mostly meat. It's a thin journal, yeah. um, and it's you know one of my favorites. Everything is always well referenced and relatively well written. So I highly recommend doing that. It's ler dot com. Yeah, and you can get that online, folks. I mean, I just I just favorite them. I know you like the print edition, and that's fine. But a lot of folks just like quick and easy, and I just favorited them on Facebook, and you get the feed and all the articles. Um, sometimes before I will. So, <laughs> so um, a couple other things. We had a great lecture this week over on online CE. Uh, remember, third Wednesday of every month. Uh, an hour-long lecture. It's usually a, a, a high-tech PowerPoint that we've done with video slides and, and, and videos and, and gate cases and whatnot. And we talked about some neurologic disorders, and we don't need to go into that here. We're going to start to try to, and I've, and I've promised each other to try and remind you, um, to put this up, that um, once we get the okay from the uh, company that it's up, we will put the link up for you guys because we know we kind of tease you each week on on social media. So we'll try and make sure we get the link up once it's ready, and then you guys can go over there and take the course. I think it's 19 bucks for a, an hour. You get a credit for your uh, license and everything else. So uh, worth your time. We've got a whole library of things there. So if you like what we've done, just find the other 30 or so that we've done, and you can take a whole catalog of courses there. We... Um, we put something else up. It was kind of a neuro week here on social media with us at the Gate Guys, and we talked a lot about arm swing. And you'd put one up that we had uh, done together a long time ago, go about arm swing, and could there be early signs of um, neurologic disease when the arm swing gets uh, uh, abbreviated or changed, or there's some asymmetrical pendular movements of one arm over the other. And we mentioned in the lecture that these things are quite frequently one of the first signs that you will see as a clinician, even before there may be some other diagnostic or lab tests that show um, some of these diseases. You know, gait is so sensitive from vestibular and cerebellar and cervical um, to oh, peripheral neuropathies and things like this. So sometimes a subtle shift in gait, if you know what to look for, and if in fact you're looking for it at all, um, is going to show up first. And you know, there's a lot of information suggesting that it can diagnose the dementias and the Alzheimer's and Parkinsonian type disorders before a lot of those tests come out positive. A lot of these disorders, and we even mentioned um, CIDP, chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy this week is one of the cases. And if you catch these things early when they're demyelinating, you can save a lot of those axons if you can get their client on IgG therapy or prednisone or something that knocks down the inflammation and the degradation of the axon so uh, nothing like catching these things early it'll make you look good when you send something over to a neurologist and they you catch it before they do it might actually help get a good referral program and that's what's happened in my practice I've got some neurologists that trust me so it's really quite nice one of the things that we that you had put up and I'd forgotten about this was a cool study about when they uh, casted or splinted an arm and how there was such a rapid shift in the resources of the um the cortical thickness in the brain. I thought that was really cool, and I totally forgot about that. It's always neat to go back and read the stuff that we've written several years ago. 
and how that um, in under two weeks there was a, an automatic it was already gray and white matter increases in the opposite side of the brain um, that would run the hand or arm that was in the cast which um, I think it shocked me just as much as it did when we wrote this thing that under two weeks these cortical thickness changes are already occurring um, some seems almost um, almost impossible it's happening that fast doesn't it isn't it shocking to you how quickly this changes no, um, yes and no I mean you're going to see pretty huge changes pretty fast um, that are occurring on a genetic level and that's why you can see remodeling happening at such a fast rate so you know when you're looking at cortex basically um, cortex is all nerve cell bodies that's what we're looking at that's the gray matter the white matter is axons or uh, the things coming out of the nerve that's going to transmit the information, the efferent portion there. And considering like actions and simple things like us talking right now or working on the phone and learning a new task is going to canalize certain pathways and you know defacilitate other pathways, it's not really um, not really super surprising that you're going to see changes um, that quickly. You know, you think of things like neural adaptation where people, get stronger pretty quickly. So if you go to the gym, you lift today, more than likely you're going to notice tomorrow, even if you're sore, that you're stronger in that. And that's because you're facilitating those pathways. You practice balance for, you know, in the morning and you do it several times throughout the day. By that evening, you're already going to be balancing better provided you have neurological integrity um, in your system. So not super surprising. Um, you know, you think of it, oh, dude, this is all occurring on a subatomic level. But when you see changes like that in, you know, just a few weeks, you realize that this is way more than a subatomic level. And the impact we have as manual therapists on folks is, you know, quite significant. I mean, we've all, you know, had those miracle treatments in the office where they come in, not just subjectively with pain, but with objective findings that you're seeing, you know, crappy reflexes, weak muscles, they can't do a certain motion, you know, whatever, and you do your thing. And those people are instantaneously able to perform a movement of the muscle is stronger or the balance task is better or they're more coordinated. Um, we see that all the time. So it's it's surprising, yes, but it's not really surprising mm -hmm. when you consider the, the wonderful marvel uh, of the nervous system that we get to play with um, on a daily basis. Yeah, these adoptive patterns that patients get into that are merely their compensations to adapt often are pain inhibitory or pain avoidance. And, um, you know, it makes sense that these pathways are just kind of put to the side and they use an adoptive path in order to get a function completed and... Uh, Sometimes those types of compensations lead to problems and a sudden re-engagement of a, a neural pathway, as you have just alluded to, um, all of a sudden their function comes back and it looks miraculous, but it's just, uh, you know, the pattern they should have been using all along. So neat stuff as always. So we should get into some of the meat here today, but I just happened to be on uh, OutsideOnline.com, one of my favorite online magazines. I used to get the magazine itself, and of course, it's Tour de France type time here in uh, in the world, and uh, over in France there, there's the, 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 the crazy tour guys, and uh, they, were, it was, they were talking about the changes that go through these poor guys' bodies, and they were talking about saddle sores and the immune system and how much weight these guys lose and the amount of calories they burn. You know, and I was a little shocked by when they looked at the bone issues because these guys are so non-weight bearing for so long, not only in their training, but for the three weeks that this thing is up in the mountains pretty much. And they found that weightlifters and boxers had an overall higher bone density than the controls while cyclists' spines were 10% less dense, their hips were 14% less dense, and their Ward's Triangle, which I believe, if I can remember correctly, and you might know this, it's a, just a radiographic thing off the neck of the femur. Uh, is 17% uh, less dense. So these guys are not doing a lot of the pounding, impact loading, weight bearing stuff that the rest of the world does. So there's some double digit losses here, which are a little shocking, but hopefully these guys in their off season are running and trying to offset some of that stuff. So you know, remember the bones are, are, are built up and broken down on a daily basis with osteoblastic and osteoclastic activity. And as we tend to get older or have other types of diseases, the blastic activity is underscored by the, or the blastic activity is, uh, yeah, underscored by the clastic activity. So 
Uh, in other words, the the breakdown is faster than the buildup. So, but uh, just was a little surprised by those numbers, a little higher than I thought. Important to one, eat well and eat clean. Two, make sure that you exercise regularly because weight bearing exercise is going to have a tendency to cause deposition. And three, make sure you know that you stay away from bisphenols and. CFCs and that kind of stuff because all those things are going to create problems with exogenous estrogens and things like that which are going to deplete some of those levels. Stay away from soda because that, you know, generally like most commercial sodas have a tendency to drain calcium and magnesium and also magnesium is probably more important if not at least just as important than calcium is in uh, bone density. So adequate calcium in your diet doesn't mean you need to start drinking dairy or something like that green leafy vegetables are loaded with uh loaded with calcium yeah so let's talk about usain bolt this was in the new york times just this week uh, middle of july uh if you don't know who usain bolt is you're obviously not following running very much he's the 31 year old jamaican runner the fastest sprinter in history world record holder at the 100 and 200 and god knows what else in three different olympics um tall guy you know completes 100 meters in what 40 i forget what the numbers are the high 40 or low 40 steps whereas everybody else is maybe another 10 or so steps uh, more to get to the the finish line so definitely has some advantages but this study was interesting this goes back to gosh the beginning of the gate guys or early years of us back seven eight years ago when we were conversing with peter way and over at the uh, southern methodist university smu and their expert gate lab and he's got some research here last month uh, of 2017 with andrew udofa um, and they're looking at Usain Bolt and some of his mechanics. Certainly they haven't examined him, so they're going, I think, off of some of the previous data that has been put out there in some of the videos. But uh, uniquely, they were looking at his stride and that uh, they've determined that his right leg appears to strike the track with about 13% more peak force than his left leg. Uh, and with each stride, the left leg remains on the ground about 14% longer than his right leg. And um, so conventional wisdom, as they suggest in this article, is that this may be slowing him down. But these guys tend to think that maybe not, although uh, they I should say that they and they do remark in this study that this is not conclusive. It's theoretical at this time. They call it their working idea that he may have optimized his speed and that the, his asymmetry reflects that. But it was find it interesting to know, and I did not know this, that he does have apparently a scoliosis, which obviously is going to change his spine in the um, axial and frontal plane, eat up some of his height a little bit, but it's also going to acquire some pelvic distortion patterns that may render um, a leg length discrepancy, which they concluded has occurred uh, on his left leg, that it's um, an inch shorter, I think. No, right leg half an inch shorter than his left. So right leg is half an inch shorter. And the numbers that I proposed before were um, that his right leg appears to strike the track with about 13% more peak force than his left, so the short leg. Um, so I thought that was interesting. These guys were a little shocked that it's in the teens, the 13 or 14%, because most of the studies support a 1, 2, or 3% or a low single-digit differential. Um, the, I guess my problem in this was that... Um, they felt, and they quoted way into saying, correcting his asymmetry would not speed him up and might even slow him down. If he were to run symmetrically, it could be an unnatural gait for him. I don't deny that it could be unnatural for him until maybe he has trained it back in that it's natural. Of course, if you immediately change his leg length, you put a sole lift into his shoe, make that right leg half an inch longer, it's going to be unnatural for him until he runs on it long enough that it's natural. Um, so to propose that... he it, it might not speed him up, I think, was a bit of a stretch, and I, I tend to disagree with that. I know in my practice and in yours, I try to go for symmetry when possible. These scoliosis patients certainly do make that very difficult because you've got a structural problem. But um, leveling out the pelvis uh, and trying to give a client two equal leg lengths just kind of makes sense from a mechanical standpoint. 
But do you mess around with someone who's the fastest man on earth? Maybe you just kind of leave it alone. So kind of hard to argue with it, but it is an arguable point, in at least in my opinion. Um, so kind of pure speculation on there and that trying to change it might not be good. But what do you think? What are your thoughts on this, at least after reading it? And then we'll bounce around some ideas here. Well, a few different things. You know, First of all, um, with the leg length discrepancy that he has there, the right leg having more force because it has further to fall and the left leg being longer on the time because the stri- on the ground because the stride length can be increased on that longer side just sort of confirms what we've been saying here you know for a long time when we look at people that actually have an anatomical deficiency in one leg or the other um so th- so that's one thing that kind of confirms stuff number 2 he's just incredibly gifted with regards to biomechanics and neurology. And if you break this down to pure physics, you know, they say, oh, he he may be too tall to be a sprinter. Well, power equals force times displacement. If you've got really long legs, you can generate more power, um, basically because your displacement, you know, length is longer. (laughs) So provided you can accelerate that at a rate that it needs to, you're going to generate more power, which could be another reason that he does this. One of the things that I noticed, and when you sent this over, um, I spent a bunch of time on YouTube looking at a bunch of Usain clips of him running and coming out of the starting blocks and a few other things like that. And, and a couple things that I noticed that make sense to me as to why he's fast. Um, and then I'll talk about things that I think you know could certainly potentially improve um, his speed, even though that doesn't seem you know possible. He does the uh, the 10 meter in 0.83 seconds, you know, which is the fastest known to anybody. And the 10 meter, I'm sorry, the 100 meter at like 9.58 seconds. So he, he's incredibly fast. But but a few things that you notice right off the bat is one, he's, he's a little slower out of the blocks than everybody else. And I'm assuming that's due to his size and his ability to generate some of that power. Um, number two, if you watch him and you watch other racers coming out of the blocks, one of the things you will see, now all of these people um, you know, are sprinters. They will have their head flexed when they're first starting. Usain is almost always, if not always, the first one to bring his head to an upright posture. In other words, extend his head. Now, so strictly from a neurological perspective, this is going to fire more into the extensor pool, which is going to theoretically give him more power out of his glutes, you know, hamstrings, all of his extensors on that side. So so that's, you know, a big thing. The other thing that I noticed is if you see, and it's not in every clip, but it's in most clips, he's got a head tilt to the right, especially when he's running, especially when he's accelerating. At the end of a race, when he turns, he always turns to the right. Um, so maybe this is secondary to his short leg. Maybe he's just taking advantage of a tonic neck response Um, on that side. And as he turns his head to the right, or he leans his head to the right, he's going to have a tendency to extend his extremities more on that side. Now, some people would say, oh, well, TNRs go away. And when they appear later in life, they're always pathological. But you can see changes. I can stick EMG needles in your muscles, your flexors on one side, your extensors on the other, and I can just have you lying on a table passively and I can rotate your head. And the side I rotate your head to, you're going to see increased activity, little bursts of activity in the extensors. And the opposite side, you're going to see increased activity in the flexors. And, um, you know, don't believe me, do it for yourself. You know, when we had an EMG in the office, we did all of these really nifty sort of experiments with people because we wanted to see stuff um, and see why it's occurring. So that perhaps can be another another thing that can explain some of what's going on. And go back and look at some of the clips and you'll see what I'm talking about. Um, a lot of the runners that you see, they all have mechanical inefficiencies that we can say, oh, well, you know, if they did this, they could improve. And that's all conjecture. Maybe they would, maybe they wouldn't. Um, I'm a sincere believer that if you were to correct for some of his leg length discrepancy, and maybe they have, I don't know what's in his shoe, um, he theoretically could be faster because that would change some of the biomechanical efficiency. However, with that being said, he's been doing this for so long at this level, and he's caused the neurological remodeling to occur um, over time. So initially, if you were to do this, he may be slower. But 
over time, as the system adapts and they're able to take up that little bit of slack, you know, both in the nervous system as well as mechanically what's going on and biomechanically what's going on, theoretically he could become more efficient because the muscles just don't have to work as hard. And, you know, simple principles taking advantage of different biomechanical things would make a difference. And it would also be interesting to look at his scoliosis um, and what kind of a scoliosis is it? Is it secondary to the short leg or is it not? And what's the twist, you know, occurring in his lumbar spine? Generally speaking, when we have um, a scoliotic change in a short leg, you're going to see body rotation to the shorter leg side, which is going to limit the amount of rotation um, that can occur in that direction. In other words, the direction of the scoliosis if it's a right lumbar. Um, in the lumbar spine. Now remember the lumbar spine only has about five degrees of rotation from top to bottom with most of that occurring, two to three degrees occurring at L5-S1. So you're sort of pre-rotated, which is going to limit the amount of torso rotation on one side compared to the other. And perhaps that's what causes his head turned to, to one side that we see there. Um, theoretically, if the scoliosis is only due to the short leg and there's not actual changes within the the vertebrae themselves, improving that rotational ability could theoretically make them faster as well. But anyway, that's my my take on it. Well, while you were talking there, I, I did um, I did look at some videos uh, as well. One of them was a, a video that was taken straight down on the track. There was no evidence of any right leg turnout, which you would see typically when you rotate the. Uh, leg f from the hip out into the frontal plane, you can get a little bit longer uh, leg length and make up for the difference. We know that supination can do that too, and I didn't see that. In fact, on another video, it looked like his left foot was turned out a little bit more. Um, so, you know, is there that much of a leg length discrepancy? And in a man who is six foot five, who's got a scoliosis, who might actually be six foot eight or so, is a half an inch that much? I mean, in a normal sized person, that might be a quarter inch or less. And so it's all relative, so to speak. But is that that much of a difference? So keep that in mind, too. Um, a half an inch sounds a lot, but when you take a person who's 6'5", plus another couple inches in the frontal plane that have been eaten up by uh, you know, a scoliosis and a compensatory thoracic curve, it might not be that much. Um, so all interesting stuff. And uh, I know you and I would geek out working with someone like this and playing around. But uh, according to this article, Usain doesn't really care too much about this stuff. It's more about training and just working with what he has. I don't know how deep into the science he gets. Um, I did find this interesting in the article. No sprinter can accelerate for a full 100 meters. But once Bolt reaches top speed at 60 to 70 meters, he maintains his velocity more efficiently than the others thus decelerating less towards the finish line. The winner of a sprint is not necessarily the person speeding up the fastest at the end, but slowing down the slowest or the least. So um, pretty cool stuff. Uh, this article is worth your time. It's just generally interesting. It brought up a whole bunch of thoughts. You covered a bunch of them. So did I. Um, a lot of math in here. Uh, they talk about the, th the uh, what was that critical number? The... Uh, was it 30 millisecond numbers, the gold medal number? Three hundredths of a second, excuse me. 30 milliseconds to glory, I guess, is what they were saying here. And that's the difference. That's the key number. Peak impact force is delivered within three hundredths of a second or 30 milliseconds of striking the track. Uh, it is one of the most critical moments of sprinting. Less force put into the ground means less pop back into the air says Lawrence Ryan at SMU Lab. He calls it the 30 milliseconds to glory. So neat article. We'll have it in the show notes. Always cool stuff to look at the numbers. Peter Wayand is, is a genius and he's smart. Um, they still don't have all the answers. Neither do we. So there's going to be more stuff coming down the line here as the years go by and as technology and virtual reality and, you know, the ability to increase Imp implant, excuse me, implant chips into people so that we can now get more real-time data and numbers. So should be cool stuff. So I'm going to talk. I'm going to mention something. I saw this case in my office. Um, it had been a couple years since I'd seen one, and I thought, oh, I should mention this one on the podcast. The first time this disorder was brought to, or this injury was brought to my attention was in my residency back in the mid-90s. And... Um, 
my mentor, uh, Dr. Dennis Skogsberg, during my three-year in-house residency in orthopedics um, with some of the, the big names in our profession still. Um, he would give us very obscure projects that we would have to present within the next month. And I was given the plantaris tear. For those of you who have taken anatomy, the plantaris is often referred to as the freshman nerve because on cadaver exams, bell ringer exams, they would often tag this thing uh, because the tendon looks just like a nerve. And it's this long, skinny muscle that comes out of the posterior compartment of the lower leg. Um, it, uh, it wrestles with some trivial space between the gastrox and the soleus and the Achilles tendon and the long flexors. This is a very long skinny muscle. It is one that is frequently thought to be useless and becoming evolutionarily uh, defunct and is often taken out as a tendon to replace other tendons, uh, often for wrist surgeries. At least that's what it used to be back then. I'm trying to remember my data from back way back when, but I did pull up a recent article. I'll put it in the show notes. It was brought to my attention because one of my tennis players um, came in and she said, Sean, I'm not sure what's going on. That's why I called the office this morning, but I thought I'd come in. And I was playing um, at tennis and we were playing doubles and I was at the net and all of a sudden I, f- I moved, I twisted to get a ball and I felt this ball hit me in the calf. And I turned around expecting someone to call a let and, you know, and, and, but there was no ball to be found. And she, she, as she said, I was a little surprised that, because I was sure something had hit me in the back of the calf. And then I realized, uh, I couldn't walk. And so I hobbled off the, uh, the court and, uh, it seemed like everything was intact. She came over to my office. There was no swelling. At this time, she had good plantar flexor, dorsiflexion function. Neurologically, she was intact. The pulses were there. Um, The knee checked out just fine. The ACL was fine. I'm thinking, hmm, everything looks good. And boom, I love it when those things pop into your head. Oh, plantaris tear. And I went right over, typed it in, and um, it came up as tennis leg. They're now calling this tennis leg. And as it will say right in this article... The patient, um, here, the injury occurs most frequently when running or jumping and usually results from an eccentric load placed across the knee, across the ankle with the knee in extended position. Even though the injury is the result of an indirect mechanism, subjectively the patient may describe direct trauma to the calf. Often the athlete feels as though they were struck on the calf by an object such as a ball or a piece of equipment. So immediately I turned to my client and read that and she goes, oh, sounds like me. So you obviously need to rule out things like a ruptured Baker cyst and, you know, a a sudden clot and you need to make sure that they didn't tear anything in the knee. But these clients often express this just like she does. There's no massive knee injury. There's nothing in the ankle. It just feels like someone hit them in the back of the calf with a BB gun or a tennis ball or something like that. Over the next two days, uh, the calf was very painful She, unlike a lot of the clients, had full plantar flexion, full dorsiflexion power and strength, but a little bit of discomfort at terminal plantar flexion or terminal heel rise when she went up onto her, onto the ball of her foot. Over the next few days, it was a mild amount of swelling down around the ankle and a little bit of bruising. Uh, I was pretty confident with my diagnosis because everything else checked out. This is not a patient who is very keen on aggressive, I need imaging, I need this, let's do this. She was like, sounds like me let's let it go uh long story short 10 days later she's back to playing tennis no pain at all no motor loss no sensory loss no compromise at the knee or the ankle it was clear to me that she had had a plantaris rupture i think if we did an mri we'd probably find that it was completely ruptured but um this is such a small um inconsequential tendon uh heck they take it out for other surgeries some people don't even have it i think it's absent about 20 percent of the people uh, on this planet so it's one of those diagnosis of exclusion and familiarity with its history and its past so you need to know its anatomy that it comes off the back of the calf it goes through the popliteal compartment it attaches right beside the achilles tendon it's frequently not torn with achilles tears It has the same neurology, the S1, S2, tibial nerve to the triceps uh, surrey group. So it's just one of those things. You need to rule out Achilles tendon rupture. First thing you always check is the Achilles tendon intact. Um, And so 
just a great little case of um, something that completely tore, but it is inconsequential. And even if you look into the, the uh, literature, it says just leave this thing alone if you're sure of the diagnosis and everything else seems okay. So thought I'd throw that one in here because someone is going to be hearing this somewhere around the world and they're going to go, I had that, or maybe that's what I have. So ever seen one? You know, I haven't seen a plantaris tear per se. I have seen lots of mid-Achilles tendinopathies. And if you look at the anatomical studies about the plantaris, and I forget what the percentage is, but a certain percentage attach to the mid portion of the Achilles tendon and do not have a separate attention, uh, attachment um, to the calcaneus or do not insert at the inferior aspect. So I've seen plantaris issues. Uh, one in particular comes to me, mind of a skier who is doing a lot of skinning, you know, where they basically, uh, you know, use skins on the bottom of the skis and go uphill um, racing mm-hmm. and had overtrained and had a mid Achilles tendinopathy that nobody could uh, seem to fix, and that's because nobody was addressing the plantaris. Um, with your gal, something to remember, and just keep this in the back of your mind, um, you know, your plantaris comes up, it attaches basically to the lateral aspect of the inferior portion of the femur and also the oblique popliteal ligament. If you think about the position um, of the foot when it's on the ground, most of the time when you're playing tennis, you're in mid stance to terminal stance and you're whacking a ball. So you're at full internal rotation of that extremity. And what has to happen as we pivot from that to move, much like I imagined your gal, is you have to move from that full internally rotated pronated position into a um, into an externally um, rotated position to supinate that foot so you can move to the other side. And I think because the lateral gastroc and some other muscles um, are are going to be involved with that, as well as the medial gastroc, of, co- of course. Um, it occurs when that foot is planted and we go to do a pivot. And what happens is that gets recruited in all the excitement. And because its cross-sectional area is smaller than the gastroc or the soleus, remember the gastroc has larger medial head, soleus has larger lateral head, and this passes kind of right between the two of them, that maybe it, it kind of gets caught in the crossfire, and that might be one of the reasons that it has a tendency to a rupture, particularly if that lower extremity is in a fully internally rotated position, because it just places that long tendon, which is going to create a lot of tension, at a mechanical disadvantage. Yeah, and when loaded, this thing is just basically a long elastic band that just snaps, and in her case, that's what she felt. So, so I've seen three, I believe, in my um, in my career. I didn't image any of them, and all clients within two weeks had returned to full function without any sequela, without any power, sensory motor deficits, and um, absolutely no problems whatsoever. So what else could it be? It's probably that. So remember, diagnostic imaging, particularly the high-end things, CT scans and MRIs are for confirming diagnoses. Uh, they shouldn't be your fact-finding mission. If you're using imaging to make your diagnosis, then you don't know enough of your um, your pathology and biomechanics. Uh, imaging is there to confirm diagnoses and confirm um, more aggressive means, uh, or at least ruling out tumors or ruling in tumors or things that are more aggressive. But uh, quite frequently, imaging is used to help find the problem, and that's just bad diagnostics. So um, I have one eye on a mission to get smarter. I'm sure all of you are as well. That's why we're here. That's probably why you're here. So hopefully we don't miss too many things in our career and we uh, catch them at least you know, soon enough down the road, but this is a case I wouldn't image. As I say to my clients, if this is a need to know thing for you, please go get some imaging from your primary care doctor. I said, um, because I'm not in your network, because I'm a cash practice, you need to go to them. But in in all intensive purposes, this is a done deal. You're already healed. But if you need to know, go ahead. So it's not going to change my treatment. I treat you, not the imaging. It's kind of the verbiage I use. So So since we're talking about this poster compartment things, in previous podcasts, we've talked about Achilles tendinopathy and isometrics and that you don't want tensile loads and compressive loads across a tendinopathy. You want uh, to increase the stiffness, as we discussed last podcast, that a lot of these tendinopathies are expressing 
a decreased stiffness of the tendon, which is what creates a lot of the pain and uh, dysfunction. What are your thoughts? Because there was a dialogue with Joe Cook and some others online about using a heel lift during the early phases of um, maintenance or uh, management of these types of things. It would make sense that it would take the terminal lengthening or stretching of the gastroc soleus if the heel didn't have to go as um, far down to the ground. It certainly makes sense to me, but now you're actually posturing this client in relative plantar flexion. You're allowing the posterior mechanism, the gastroc soleus complex, to shorten, but maybe that's not a bad thing, at least while they're walking around while you're trying to manage it. Eventually, you're going to have to return them to full length, which can present its own set of problems. But what are your initial thoughts on that, at least in the management phase, to take away at least the tensile loading across a tendinopathy? Um, certainly, the walking is going to, still going to have some compressive loads as the muscle concentrically shortens. But what are your thoughts, and do you use them in these types of things? Um, my thoughts are with tendinopathies, tendons a lot of times um, don't do well with compression. They do a little bit better with tension as far as healing goes. So cross, you know, uh, compression with a foam roller and stuff like that, probably not so um, so much effective. Um, no, I don't use heel lifts rarely for causing pelvic rotations and things like that. I'll use a heel lift um, or a sole lift, but um, and I'll bevel it, you know. But mm-hmm. I, yeah, I just don't do that. Um, what we do is we shorten their stride length and we do other things from a, a standpoint of, you know, possibly place them in a rock or chew um, or something mm-hmm. along those lines. But I generally don't don't just lift the heel. And, you know, we tend to be <laughs> pretty aggressive with our rehab, um, as I'm sure you are. You know, it's just a matter of pushing them hard enough so you're going to get the best effect but not pushing them so hard that you break them and um, that's always walking a fine line and sometimes you go too far you know in the wrong direction Mm -hmm. and you need Mm -hmm. to kind of dial it back a little bit but no I, I i generally don't do that so think about when someone is in a high heel shoe um think of a woman in high heel shoes they tend to be more on the ball of their foot uh a little bit anyways uh the uh the butt sticks out they go into an anterior pelvic tilt, chest goes into thoracic um, extension, so it, it accentuates the curves. That's why high heel shoes are worn quite frequently. They're, uh, they're, they make the woman, in theory, uh, more attractive, or a man if you're into that. But um, I tend to go that route, and meaning I will ask them to go and get some running shoes that have a higher drop, like a 12 or 13 millimeter, and I'll have them wear those shoes on both sides. Rather than putting a heel lift in, as you suggested, and I'm glad you went down that road, just putting a heel lift on one side creates an anterior pelvic tilt and a change in the the pelvic distortion away from neutral and symmetrical. And so now you start to create this torsional distortion in the pelvis, uh, asymmetric loading. You've got a, a relative anterior pelvic tilt on one side, which means you've got a relative posterior pelvic tilt of the hemipelvis on the other side, and which creates a rotation in the lumbar spine, which then makes a compensatory rotation in the thoracic spine. Now you've got arm swing and leg swing and step links that are different. So I don't like using a heel lift on one side. I never have. We've always talked about if you've got a short leg, lift the whole thing, not just the f- rear foot. Rift, lift the forefoot and the rear foot. But in these types of posterior tendinopathies, if I need to, to ease it up a little bit, I ask the client to go ahead and get some running shoes that have a, a heel lift on both sides. And if it's a lady or a man who's got dress shoes, wear your dress shoes. Um, let's shorten both of them so at least your pelvis is symmetrical and we'll deal with dropping you down into a lower drop in time. So I tended to disagree with the dialogue that was on Twitter at this time about the heel lifts, but I mean, it was a pretty soft discussion, but at least in thought, I think that they were on the right page, but I like to maintain symmetry if I have to. It's easier to drop both legs down to a normal zero drop or whatever um, after everything is settled down or as they're progressing, maybe move down to a six or eight millimeter drop shoe and then uh, into three or four and then barefoot walking again. So it's just that in a lot of these Achilles tendinopathies, the client doesn't like to be barefoot because the Achilles is under such a stretch load because the heel is on the same plane as the forefoot. So there you go. Well, so just out of curiosity, I have to admit that I am definitely a fan of the aesthetic attributes that high heels provide um, 
to individuals um, as far as that goes, although I'm not wild about what it does to their uh, gait. But as long as people don't walk in them, um, that, that can be an okay thing. But do you, do you know any of the theories as to where high heels supposedly originated from? It really had nothing to do with female form. Um, well, we've talked about this on previous podcasts, but I know yeah. we get a lot of new listeners every single month, and some people haven't gone back probably 50 or 60 podcasts. So go ahead and tell the story again, because it's always interesting, and I love to tell it to my patients. So there's a lot of, there's probably several thousand new folks who haven't gone that far back into the podcast. So share the story. It's a good one. Well, there's just, you know, there's two prevailing theories. One was that heels were originally put on boots for people riding horses to prevent your foot from sliding completely through the stirrup. And uh, that way, if you fell off the horse, you wouldn't break your ankle or be dragged uh, by the horse. So that that's one of the theories. Um, and that dates back to the early 1700s. Um, the other is that, um, and this predates that, um, back before we had, you know, modern sanitation and stuff like that, the streets were literally filled with, you know, feces and you know, sewage and garbage and trash and those sorts of things. So um, people, and I believe it started in France, um, would wear shoes, sort of like platform shoes or elevator shoes, which would literally get them above or out of that stuff. Those shoes were called chapines. Um, and if you go back into you know the Tumblr blog or if you go back into the gateguys.com, you can do some research on that. But that's the two prevailing theories as to where they actually started and why, um, which is kind of interesting. And to, to kind of piggyback on what you said before, we have utilized shoes, you know, because we'll, we sell shoes in the office, obviously, um, which have somewhat of a drop or somewhat of a heel. So we may take somebody, if they're in a flatter shoe, and put them in like you said you know i think the the steepest drop shoe we have in the office is 14 millimeters it's one of the brooks Uh, but we may put them in something like that to take a slight pressure off of that but from most of the research that i've read lifting the heels not necessarily um, super effective uh, for any kind of decreased healing or anything uh, particularly with um, acute achilles tendinopathies so Sounds good. Listen, folks, I'm going to say it again. There's, I'm, I'm just looking at our Facebook feed, and there's a lot of stuff that we've put up in the last couple of weeks that doesn't make it over to the blog. If you are just following us on the blog, uh, which is thegateguys.com, and you're not following us on social media, you're probably getting half of the party. So make sure you head over and at least check us out on Twitter because we've linked our Facebook account over to Twitter. Um, so when something does go up on Facebook, it goes to Twitter, um, and it's easy to, to just screen through our Twitter feed to find the stuff that you're looking for. But um, uh, if you're just trying to follow us on the blog, you're missing out on stuff. And one of my good friends has just found out that <laughs> that was the case, and he didn't realize how much information he has been missing, which made him very angry. So um, make sure you get over there, okay? We try not to fill our feed full of garbage, so um, we're a little bit like drinking from the fire hose, as Ivo likes to say, and um, if you like doing that and playing dangerous games like that, that's where you need to be over on Facebook, Dangerous Games. So anyways, thanks for everything that you guys do. We've uh, The numbers have just been ex- ex- extraordinary. Um, I'm shocked. I, Ivo and I were talking recently about the numbers over on social media and on our blog and on our podcast, and... I mean, we're eight years, nine years into this right now, and I'm shocked to see how many people from around the world are following us. We're getting, I just sent Ivo an email today of a gentleman who is a a PhD in um, gate research, and it's always nice to see that these folks even find great value in the stuff that we're doing, and they're loving it, and uh, so, good news. Anyways, I'm babbling. Let's get out of here. Sean Allen in Chicago. I have a whirl up in Dillon, Colorado. We will see you in the shoe aisle.